Okay, now we're now joined um, uh, by Will Wilde, who, um, uh, who's also coming with us on the trip as, as, a, as the division's kind of embedded writer, I suppose. Um, Will is deputy editor of um, uh, the architecture and design journal Icon, um, and has recently completed his debut novel, um, Care of Wooden Floors, a uh, black comedy about a man being driven insane by minimum mistake, or um, I think we can all identify with that. Um, uh, through the Unknown Fields Project, um, Will will also be developing uh, a new book titled Toxic Tourism, um, which will be published by Harper Press um, uh, a little while after we, we come back. So Will will be travelling with us, um, uh, developing this, this sort of travelogue of the, of the places we visit, um, documenting the, the, the tour as a journalist, I suppose, um, a, a, almost like a, a, a strange form of the travelogue. Um, but uh, we'll also be kind of engaging with um, uh, people within the division and in, in, in talking about talking about narrative and fiction um, uh, and, and the role of that within the project. So we thought it'd be great um, just to, to, to bring Win and Will in on this panel um, to introduce a bit about um, kind of what interests him and, and his role on the trip um, and uh, his relationship to these sites and what he's thinking about uh, developing with this. Thanks, Will. Um, I'm not a very confident public speaker, so I'll keep this as brief as possible. Um, but just to um, expand on what Liam's already said about my uh, novel, um, it is about a man who is driven insane onto the point, point of insanity by um, minimalist decor. Um, it concerns a uh, minimalist composer called um, Oscar, who, uh, who writes um, symphonies inspired by um, tram timetables and the Dewey Decimal System and that sort of thing who has uh, built a beautiful um, modernist interior for himself in an apartment in an Eastern European city. Um, but it's not really about him in the sense that it's actually about the person he um, gives his flat to to look after while he's uh, away for a few weeks. And um, one of my intentions for the book was just to um, look at the sort of modernist conceit that um, a, a, a the perfect environment could help us be a better person. It's not just a modernist conceit, it's a conceit of architecture in general. Um, and the uh, person who is meant to be looking after this flat believes that because it's you know beautiful and it's uh, the flat of a composer, he'll be a better and more creative person when he's inside it. Um, and it turns out not to be the case. But there is a sort of um, an underlying thread of uh, criticism of, of modernism in there. In um, toxic tourism, I mean, what I'm mostly confronted with at the moment is questions rather than answers, because obviously I haven't been on the trip yet, I'm still in the midst of research, and I, um, what I'm most struck by is just my own sense of fascination with um, these places, uh, Chernobyl, Baikonur, and the Aral Sea. I, when uh, Liam mentioned the trip to me, when I heard about the trip, I knew I immediately knew I wanted to come, um, but I didn't uh, know exactly why. And the book is really going to be attempting to answer that. What is the fascination of these, um, these places, a dried out seabed, a, a ruined city, um, and uh, a rickety spaceport? Um, now, in this talk, I just want to kind of talk a little bit about my thinking about that. And um, also, I should just straight away give credit to two uh, writers who I'm partly basing some of this on. First of all, Christopher, Wood <coughs> Christopher Woodward, who wrote a wonderful book called In Ruins, which I strongly recommend, and uh, Brian Dillon, who's a professor and uh, an expert on ruins. Uh, this is a um, drawing by uh, the artist Fuseli, um, <coughs> called uh, The Artist Driven. Can you see? Oh, yeah, there's a. The Artist over Driven to Despair by. Um, uh, artist Moved to Despair by Ruins, by the grandeur of ruins. Um, in the 18th century, driven by the Grand Tour, um, the uh, idea of the ruin, uh, the Grand Tour was when the uh, you know, English aristocrats uh, went around uh, Italy and um, Greece and Turkey looking at Roman and Greek ruins and, generally speaking, being inspired and moved by them. Um, the idea of the ruin overtook uh, aesthetics and um, art and uh, impressed sort of artists like Lord Byron and William Beckford. Um, they, uh, to these artists, they suggested not only the grandeur of the past, um, uh, but also the sort of degeneracy of the present, and um, as well as um, appealing to something that um, 
was a, a constant attraction for um, um, thinkers um, or um, aesthetes in the 18th and 19th century, which was the sublime. They, they loved to feel small and to feel threatened by um, grand things that were outside uh, sort of um, their modern control, modern for them. Uh, so that included, um, you know, the grandeur of nature, caves, and also the um, sort of um, Greco-Roman ruins. Um, ruin lust and nostalgia, that was what it was referred to, ruin lust, um, was uh, both considered to be, I mean, highly romantic and aesthetic activities, but also um, somewhat uh, degenerate in themselves. They were um, both considered to be sort of disorders, um, maladies, uh, you know, uh, uh, nothing good could come of them. And they came to a peak in the 1830s, a sort of ruin hysteria, uh, combined with the sort of Chartist rebellions and so on, when um, uh, the fascination with ruins also got tied up with the fascination with the possibility of the imminent demise of, of Britain, and um, painters like John Martin painted elaborate apocalyptic scenes based on the um, ruins they had seen uh, that were suggestive of London being destroyed by fire and invading armies and so on. That was a sudden apocalyptic moment in English culture that was based on uh, the, the fruit of this fascination with ruins. So um, in thinking of ruins, um, people were thinking of their own demise and the demise of their civilization. Just to move forward to the 1960s, and this ruin lust comes back. This is Robert Smithson, um, uh, a tour of the monuments of Passaic, New Jersey from 1967. His uh, hometown in New Jersey, um, which was uh, already by the 1960s post-industrial and decaying, he uh, uh, took a series of black and white photographs of it that kind of um, memorialized it, but also gave a sort of monumentality of these, these um, uh, decaying industrial structures as um, America sort of, uh, as you know, what would become the Rust Belt. In the 1960s and 1970s, uh, artists, primarily American artists like um, Robert Smithson and uh, Gordon Matt Clark, sort of rediscovered um, ruins and uh, um, started to enjoy them again. Um, Brian Dillon, again, this um, uh, professor who I'm basing all of this work on, um, describes um, Robert Smithson's work um, in Poseidon as a dialectical ruin. Um, what uh, Smithson is doing is projecting the ruin into the future and asking us to imagine a coming ca catastrophe. And it's interesting that Robert Smithson is best known for the work Spiral Jetty, which is a kind of earthwork projecting into a shallow body of water uh, in the form of a spiral, which uh, looks at it could be the um, remnant of an ancient civilization, a primitive civilization. It could be, um, you know, the, what is found remaining of our own civilization. But it's mysterious. It has a sense of connection to deep time, geological time, um, that connects with uh, what Michael and Mario were talking about. And this also connects with the um, work of European theorists such as Paul Virilio. I'm sorry about the small size of that image. That's a bunker tower. It's part of the Atlantic Wall. Um, uh, Paul Virilio wrote, of course, a book which most of you will be familiar with, I'm sure, called Bunker Archaeology, um, uh, uh, which was um, uh, explored these sort of uh, concrete structures left by the Nazis in the northern and western coasts of France as a um, uh, as if they were sort of um, monuments left by a sort of primitive civilization and also ruins of um, our own civilization once it disappeared. Um, but generally speaking. Aberrations, um, you know, uh, mysterious objects, um, uh, distant, uh, uncontactable um, rationales behind them, um, which overall is expressive of, of a kind of loss of faith in, in modernism that was um, uh, current. This is moving on into more recent art. Um, this is uh, Jane and Louise Wilson's Mir 2000. It's the control room of the Mir <coughs> space station. And here we have um, the sort of like ultimate end of um, the ruin last of the modern age and the ruins of the future. I mean, this is obviously an operational space station, or at least it was um, until recently. Um, and um, uh, but and yet it's uh, photographed and sort of um, valorized as a as a as a ruin. Um, it, it's a, a sort of a dead alternative, a discarded option, as the entire Soviet Union. Uh, was it was a, um, set itself up as and presented itself as an alternative civilization. Uh, I mean, self-consciously an alternative to um, you know capitalist and European civilization 
and that was um, in its own propaganda better scientific rational and um, in uh, you know uh, the West's conception um, you know the evil empire that that, that, that had to be opposed um, at every stage and, and destroyed um, and um, the work of um, artists like Jane and Louise Wilson and Supreme Gaillard um, in recent times leads straight through to what we see as around us an extraordinary popular interest in ruins. Online there are just endless photo streams of people who break into old subway and tunnels and uh, old um, factories, old insane, insane asylums and um, photograph what they find there. And um, Dylan is interesting, he says that it's almost as if by photographing a, um, a ruin you're automatically creating art, no matter um, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever the compositional basis of the photograph is that the ruin itself is art in a way, and um, by photographing it you're just simply, um, you know, it's like an instant ready-made art piece. Um, and then there's, of course, you know, very talented photographers who are working in this area, um, such as uh, Sean O'Boyle and Christopher Payne, and just move on one. Yep, that's, um, that's Christopher Payne um, from his recent book about abandoned insane asylums in the United States. But what's interesting about this image is that it could be Pripyat, or it could be Tarkovsky's stalker, or whatever, it's just a box of, you know, loads of discarded files in a room. Um, so, yeah, and obviously, there's, and there's my own fascination with these ruined cities and um, Baikonur and the dried out Aral Sea and so on, isn't special. I mean, it's not unique to me. It's um, widely um, spread. There's a, a market for these books, there's a, a hunger online for these photographs, and there's an appetite for people to go out and make these photographs and um, share them with others. Um, and in the sort of recurrent themes of um, you know, these explorations, there are, of course, it, what it almost always is, is discarded systems. Old heavy industry, now rust belt, and um, we've moved all our production over to you know, the Far East so we can uh, forget about it and, and it doesn't exist. Um, uh, the old um, mental health infrastructure, um, these giant Victorian asylums, um, which we now, you know, um, thankfully got rid of, they're pretty terrible places overall, but um, you know, our own system, our current systems dealing with mental health issues aren't much better. I mean, well, they are better, but they're not um, perfect. Uh, and um, also, of course, the sort of like the grander ruin of um, the post-Soviet world. And um, so Pripyat, in some ways, is a kind of like um, the, the Vatican of ruin in that respect. It's the um, central ruin uh, and uh, has a kind of like um, holy grail quality to these uh, urban explorers and photographers. And with all these discarded systems, there's a sense of loss, um, not necessarily because they were better than what we have now, and generally speaking, you know, no one wants heavy industry, no one wants, I mean, you know, communism wasn't very popular, um, and, uh, you know, and, um, uh, you know, this, um, these gigantic Victorians and uh, signs weren't very pleasant places, but still we wonder about what we've lost, and it makes us appraise what we have at the moment when we see that we've discarded quite elaborate, self-contained and very highly rational systems in order to make way for it. What's so great about what we have? Well, you know, it has its ups and downs and, um, you know, it makes us appraise those. <coughs> Moving on to the Aral Sea, or seabed, as we can see here. Um, so what have we lost? Um, the Soviet Union is a particular kind of, um, had a particular modernist faith throughout it, even if it did. Um, had fell in and out of love with modernist architecture. It was had, as Liam has said, this um, faith in grand projet in making nature obedient, just as the class structure could be um, tamed um, and turned to um, the interests of the state, so could um, nature. And I'm just going to read out a bit um, from a book I found, um, which was published in the Soviet Union in the 1950s um, and uh, republished as a Penguin Classic in 1961, which is how I found it, called Life in the 21st Century edited by M. Vasiliev and S. Guschov. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful book because it's um, just in it with a very sort of like um, casual attitude. It, um, it just sort of talks about um, uh, how badly organized the entire physical Earth is and how um, the geoengineers of the future might be able to improve on it. Um, I mean, for instance, um, there's a wonderful passage about how uh, mountains are an inconvenience and often uninhabitable. Which is entirely true, and you know, what they intend to do is something practical about it. 
Um, but this is um, about um, this is justifying why we should make wholesale changes to our environment and right now. When a man intends to live for a long time in a house, he modifies it according to his own desires, putting up partitions and making new doors. This is what we must do to our communal house, the earth, transform it to our own needs and our own taste. And he goes on to cite instances where uh, canals and so on have changed the world. Uh, in the future, uh, as, man power, as man's power increases, this transforming activity will develop even further. Then perhaps um, we shall make a strict list of the constructional faults of our world, just as technical commissions um, can catalogue the defects of a certain machine. And it's its entire breezy um, uh, tone. So um, no less grandiose plans um, exist, which may eventually be realised. We could build a dam from Newfoundland to Labrador and thus block the cold current which today freezes a vast region of the USA. We could dam the Straits of Gibraltar and um, exploit the enormous zones of fertile land at the bottom of the Mediterranean. We could divert the warm Kurosawa current into the cold sea of Okots. We could, <coughs> we could create in the Sahara Desert a freshwater lake which would influence the whole climate of Africa. We could deflect southwards the great Siberian rivers and use their waters to irrigate the deserts of Central Asia. This and many other plans have been worked out. And that's what they did. They killed the sea in order to make um, cotton fields. And so there was this great modernist faith in the ability of um, you know, science and technology to make the world a better place. And obviously now, in our postmodern state, we can, sit, you know, we can easily chuckle about this and sort of laugh it off as hubris and so on. But there is a kind of like, still, I think, a hankering for a simpler world in which it was possible to effect large-scale change without the sort of unintended consequences which we've now come to live with. Um, what we've lost is the sense of control. Um, modernism gave us a sense of control, rooted in science and technology, and our faith in that. And um, now we're losing that. And I just want to read out another passage very quickly. And this is by J.G. Ballard. It's from the notes to the Atrocity Exhibition. Uh, and it's connected with the Soviet space program. The Russian astronaut Colonel Komarov was the first man to die in space, though earlier fatalities have been rumoured. Komarov is reported to have panicked when his spacecraft began to tumble uncontrollably, but the transcripts of his final transmissions have never been released. I'm sceptical of what may be NASA-inspired disinformation. The courage of professional flight crews under extreme pressure is clearly shown in the black box edited by Malcolm McPherson, which contains cockpit voice recorded transcripts in the last moments before airliner crashes. The supreme courage and stoicism shown by these men and women in the final seconds running up to their deaths as they wrestled with the collapsing systems of their stricken aircraft is a fine memorial to them and a powerful argument for equal frankness in other areas. That's what we want. We want the sense of trained professionals wrestling with systems that to make to make everything all right. And you know, there's something very reassuring about that, even if it is um, paternalist. Um, and uh, Certainly in reading accounts of the meltdown in Chernobyl, we um, you know, hear of these people desperately attempting to reinsert the control rods back into the core, when it already it's hopeless, and the constant technological efforts to ameliorate the effects of the disaster in the immediate um, aftermath, um, all of which is just sort of stricken through with hubris and, and hopelessness, but um, still there's something heroic about these, the, these efforts. Um, and um, so in the, in the Aral Sea and in the in Chernobyl, in the ruins of Pripyat, and, and also in Baikonur, Baikonur, we see this sort of sense of the ruins of control, this, this, this idea which is always an illusion of control. And we also see the outline of the post-human. We see the failure of the future, the failure of um, the modernist utopia. Um, we, there is an increasing appetite and interest in a um, post-human future. This uh, image is um, of uh, a suspension bridge in Portugal, as it would look if it was uh, collapsed, um, from the Portuguese adaptation of Alan Weissman's um, book, The World Without Us, which was an international global bestseller um, examining what would happen um, to uh, the Earth if humanity just disappeared overnight. And um, the global success of this indicates a certain interest in our post-human future. Um, what would happen without us, what would happen after us. I mean, certainly, you know, our societal is, has always been a precarious business, um, but now we're much more aware of how precarious it could be in the coming years. 
And um, so we're beginning to attempt to warm up our own sense of what the planet might look like without us. And um, just as Alan Weissman devotes a lot of his book to Pripyat as a study of exactly what happens when humans are removed from the equation, um, so uh, Pripyat is an example to us all um, and uh, exerts fascination for that reason. Um, there's always a utopian, now getting back to tourism, there's always a utopian element in tourism. Um, it involves in imagining another world. I'm sure everyone's been on holiday and thought, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice to live here? Or at least examine sort of like, what, you know, what's stopping me living here and so on. And it's exactly that kind of thought experiment that's going on when we go to these sort of um, ruins and devastated um, environments. We project ourselves into a future and imagine ourselves in it. Um, and in post-human tourism, um, I mean, that's, I suppose, the ultimate. It's, it is literally getting away from it all. Um, so that's... Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you.